Okay, I'm Maura Gamble from Our Permaculture Life, and I'm in Nairobi at the moment in Kenya with Natalie Topa. And Natalie has the most amazing permaculture gardens on her verandas. But it's not just any kind of permaculture garden. There's a really deep meaning for why you have these permaculture gardens here and the experiments that you're doing are really amazing. And I, I'm so interested to be able to share your experience of all the different projects that you're you're experimenting with here and, and why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, well thank you, welcome. It's been great having you. Um, I've been living in this apartment for 10 years almost and I've been in the region of East Africa for almost 15 and uh, I started seeing a lot of the same patterns, right? Food and water insecurity, uh, energy insecurity and seeing the drought flood cycle impacting a lot of different countries uh, here in the region. And so through my work, I'm working with various agencies and my personal interests in food and cooking and gardening, it just all started to fill out one large picture for me. So um, I studied permaculture uh, formally and informally and um, I just started to see how that can play out in my life. And it really is a big part of my personal value system and my ethic. And so I realized that you know a lot of permies want to go and buy a big piece of land and do all kinds of things but we don't all have that opportunity at least not right away and so it's a matter of just starting with where we are and with what we have and so I do live in an apartment and I thought well um, if I don't have space I have to make space mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but also because you're 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 not here often as well right. and so having something that's manageable within yeah. your so it works around your work life and it's and you take the lessons that you learn here yeah. and apply them directly into the workplaces where you are which are people that don't have much land as well and so the strategies and the simple right small scale strategies that can make an enormous difference in people's lives. Yeah, so I currently work with the Danish Refugee Council and I'm the Regional Resilience and Livelihoods Coordinator for East Africa and Great Lakes region. So I cover 10 countries uh, where we work with displacement affected communities. Mm. That means refugees and internally displaced people, but also the communities that host them yeah. that are strained by suddenly having tens of thousands yeah. of new people yeah. in a place where they don't even have the services that they have. So you were saying before, there's how many, how many displaced people in the world currently? I mean, there's between 70 and 80 million. Uh, but when we talk about mixed migration, people are moving all the time for a lot of different reasons. I'm a migrant. Yep. You know, I'm uh, living in Kenya. My family were immigrants to the U.S. from Poland and Ukraine. People move for education, for work, but also because of ecological degradation mm -hmm. uh, and increasing climate extremes that also can lead to um, conflict between mm -hmm. communities. So mm -hmm. as resources become more strained in yep. East Africa, we have pastoralists and farmers who mm -hmm. rely on soil and water and viable rangeland grasses and biodiversity which are being depleted and so that also adds to displacement. Mm. So in my work I'm always looking at how you know what kinds of solutions can somebody who's displaced have just in their immediate environment mm. around their shelter uh, and also looking at the camp and settlement environment mm -hmm. and how do we bring in e ecology and gray water uh, management and integrated waste management systems. And so I'm applying my ethics to that, those mm -hmm. systems, but I'm also testing a lot of things here. Mm -hmm. So I can go ahead and talk about yeah. it. So where does it all start for you? Well, it, okay, so, you know, as, a, as somebody who um, has studied permaculture, we talk a lot about energy and entropic loss. And um, when energy comes into my system, which is the apartment, I want it to have as many spins on the merry-go-round <laughs> before it goes out. Right. And yeah. I want my waste to leave through the toilet and not through the garbage bin. Yeah. <laughs> so what that means is that, um, you know, I really try to reduce plastic you can't get away from it completely, but I really try to be very conscientious yeah. about um, what's coming in uh, to my apartment. And so um, if it's carbon, I bring cardboard boxes from the office and paper shreds. I never use my waste bin at the office because it just goes into a Disneyland of mm. disease, as I call it, that magical place called Away. Um, and so I would rather bring that home. And then, of course, the kitchen is sort of the engine of a lot of... The, um, you know, waste from food waste and things like that. So from the kitchen, if we have potato peels and food waste, it's got a few kind of choose your own adventure pathways. <laughs> <laughs> so if I'm a carrot peel or a paper shred, there's a couple options. Um, we can come into the warm bins. So yes, I'm actually doing vermicomposting, vermiculture in my apartment. And I've got a couple of warm bins um, 
This green one, which I brought in from the US, but really, it's not necessary. Um, we also have just a, some waste material. It was a, a bin that got cracked and broken, so we're reusing that. Um, and each of these has warm, warm earthworms inside of it. So food waste, paper shreds, sawdust, things like that go into either of those. Um, or waste can come to the chicken coop because there is a chicken coop on my balcony. So here, and the reason I have a chicken coop is because I want compost. And so these are the chickens. We just mixed up the, the cardboard. Um, but waste can come, it, waste does come into the chicken coop. So paper shreds, cardboard, sawdust, charcoal dust. Uh, and the chickens spend all day long scratching and mechanically breaking down all this waste and adding their little nitrogen deposits. Um, and then what happens is we take this compost after, you know, we mix it um, for a couple of weeks and when it starts to break down and become nice and rich, we then put it into these bunia bags, um, which are gunny sacks. Um, and we'll put a few handfuls of earthworms in there and then just leave them for you know as long as we want six months ten months um and then i i mean i'm to a point where i produce so much compost that i have to give it to my that friends so from farmers. <laughs> i gave 12 gunny bags like that to a, a friend of mine to, uh, on her farm yeah so the idea yeah. that i'm in a, an apartment and producing more compost that i can use because i also do need compost mm -hmm. and uh so then that compost will go from um, the gunny sacks to these uh, containers where we just harvested, so it doesn't look that green and lush, but we've just replanted with Swiss chard and collards and kale and spinach and different herbs. Um, and so that's on the pot. But some people, as I said, if you don't have space, make space. So we have actually gone up the walls with just a really inexpensive sizal string that anybody can buy here. Um, and then also over the top. Um, that's so, so great, too. It's such a simple strategy. Yeah, it's really inexpensive. And if, you, if you're in a refugee camp, you can use shoelaces and wires and cables and, and fabric that's it's shredded and, and just twisted create and, a, a yeah. climbing surface. Um, to do beans and you know add any bit of nutrition will help in yeah. that setting. Um, so here we've got Malabar spinach and one of the things that I do here is I'm always trying to propagate things that I can easily share with people in the refugee camps. So here for example in um, northern Kenya there's a refugee camp named Kakuma. Uh, we also have Dadaab refugee camp that has a lot of Somali refugees and so I can easily clip off you know some of these these vines um, send those along with other seeds and cuttings from cassava, strawberries, sweet potatoes. I've got a whole basket of sweet potatoes right behind here. So these, you know, if I just clip off one of these vines and send it to the camp, then people can e easily grow that. And it's a great cover crop because we're talking about hot, dry, arid places where it's difficult to grow food. And, and an immediate green as well yeah. as, you know, a, a starchy vegetable yeah. as well. So, I mean, it's an amazing resource. And the same with the cassava. So, do they eat the leaves there too? Um, it depends. I mean, different cultures will yeah. use food in different ways, but most everyone here does know cassava. This was a... So, I'm re we're recycling our coffee bags. We found a mango pit that had sprouted in oh, the compost. Fantastic. And so, we're um, just try to, gonna try to grow a mango yeah. tree out of that and send it to... Susie's so farm. Purple, banana. Also, yeah, the female papaya was planted here but uh, got diseased and died, but we got papayas out of that. We've got this banana tree growing. So, I mean, it's a lot of stuff that can happen in a small place. Mm. And a funny thing is, I used to have a hanging basket here with flowers, but it, it, was, uh, it had a sizal basket, and I noticed that the birds were shredding the sizal basket. Oh, wow. um, and they were destroying the basket. So it had a hanging basket, and I saw that the birds were destroying the basket, so I decided to make them their own basket, and I've got that basket here, and it's got it's full of sizal string, but also hair. So when I go and get a haircut, I don't... <laughs> I don't leave my precious carbon on that dirty oh, yeah. floor. And there's so. so much that comes out of hairdressing salons. Oh, yeah. But, you know, unfortunately, a lot of it's kind of plastic hair these yeah. days. But so, you know, you've yeah. got real hair, collect it and use it. Yeah. yeah, so a lot of people put yarn and synthetic strings mm. and stuff for the birds, but I, 
I just as soon leave yeah. that out of the yeah, system, yeah. out of the, you know, the ecosystem. Yeah. So um, the birds actually started, it's not here now because we had to redo this trellis, but they started to build a, a nest out of my hair right in that, oh. behind that log. Oh, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so so, so you don't just have one balcony either, do you? you. And no, I don't. I have another one and we'll go there mm. in a minute. But I just wanted to also say that here in this small space, um, the, you know, the earthworms, not only do they make castings from which we make liquid compost tea, but we also, they feed the, the chickens. And then we've also got, I'm doing some, you know, a lot of it's experimental, I'm learning, I'm YouTubing, but we've got um, these beetles, which make... And what sort of beetles are these? Um, oh, I can't remember the name of the beetles, mm. but they're the typical ones for making these mealworms. Oh, and so, yes. you know, I'm just using recycled... Um, containers here from cleaning products that we use from our dishwashing soap and stuff and then this I'm just trying to get the production up now but then we'll start to feed this to the chickens mm, and I'm really experimenting with this because this is something that if I were a refugee woman you know I could feed that to chickens I could sell them you know mm -hmm. um, have an income source increase the the nutrition of my of my animals and so um, and all, on top of that, we're also doing some mushroom production here. So we're really trying to optimize the use of space <laughs> here. So um, just coming back to the chickens, and so the yeah. food for the chickens is the mealworms, earthworms, Greens from your garden, food scraps yeah, from the kitchen. Yeah, a lot of food scraps, greens from the garden. We have we give them a few um, beetles and mealworms, yeah. but right now the focus on is on getting the production up yeah, okay. and just testing yeah. how does this system work. And so then you can take you know, breeding packs out to the communities as well. Yeah, and yeah. I've, I've, I mean, I have people who come here and get worms yeah. and who get uh, mealworms. Yeah. And in, even in our office, I've started a worm compost so people can yeah. just feel free to come and yeah. grab some earthworms whenever they want. And, you know, that's, a, that's the amazing thing that even from a very small space and a small worm farm, that you can start to cultivate this yeah. abundance, like simply by, you know, passing out a little bit that can be multiplied, which yeah. kind of just keeps breeding and it's breeding. It's like seed. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. You know, abundance can come from small places. Oh, yeah, for yeah. sure. And yeah. so, you know, here we're trying to um, also experiment with some mushroom production. So we're using millet to myceliate and colonize these grains for my maitake mushrooms, shiitake, pink oyster, white oyster, and then I transfer them into these bags of sawdust that I sterilize, and you can see that's also starting to colonize. And then what I'll do is I'll create a condition in another room where it's breezy and humid and cut these so we get the fruiting. So, you know, I'm just trying to learn and understand what kind of level of effort is required to go into this and technical know-how, mm -hmm. and is it feasible for people who have low capacity for these kinds of things yeah. to do to have income opportunities as yeah. well as um, nutrition yeah. so I actually remember up in um, the very the very hilly areas of, um, of Bali really poor communities mm -hmm. they, they started up two main enterprises up there one was a mushroom production mm -hmm. and another one was um, natural soap production yeah and they, from that they started an evaluating of fruits yeah. So they would be harvesting a whole lot of things. And that transformed that whole community, that yeah. network of women who started those enterprises from a community hub and just yeah. made such a difference. Yeah. Simple, small-scale production that can be done in small spaces. And it's also, in, you know, in, in a lot of the camps, what we have is waste. Yeah. And so if you can add value to waste, that yeah. is magic. <laughs> yeah. And then when you're finished with the mushrooms, yeah. the material yeah. that comes out of the bags Helps a rich goes compost. back into the yeah. system. Yeah. And then just really quickly in one refugee camp um, in Kakuma, we have a poultry project, but we're trying to figure out what's the best food source. And the team came to me and said, you know, what can we do for food? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, like as we're having this conversation outside, there's crickets jumping, like literally like <laughs> sticking, you know. And I was like, we can solve this. Yes. You know, there's food flying all over the place. Yeah, so right. I told them, pack a box of 50 crickets for me. Yeah. I'm taking them home. And they left. So I brought those crickets home. And you can't really see this. And there's not much to see. Um, but I made this had this cricket farm made and um, I had the adults in here they did lay eggs and they did uh, hatch but you know I travel a lot and I wasn't able to maintain this well and still learning but we'll keep trying you yeah. know but the idea is that again it's just connecting the you know doing proper resource mapping with the communities and, yeah. uh, and really opening our eyes as I say take out the old sim card put in the new sim card right yeah. we're now on permatel network so we <laughs> see a whole new whole new you know network yeah. um 
but how do we make those connections? Yeah. So I tell our teams it's not necessarily about doing things, different things with our programs, mm -hmm. it's about doing things differently. Yes. And just opening our eyes a bit bigger and seeing all those resources. Yeah. So anyway, we can move to the back. Okay, sure. And I can show you, oh, I did right behind you. Here's our oh. little baby tree nursery. So why not, if I've got, a, uh, if I have a ray of sunlight, we can at least grow some, try and grow some mm. trees. So these are date palms. Where did um, you collect those from? You know, here we, uh, we have a big Muslim community in, in Kenya and particularly around Ramadan, mm -hmm. we have a lot of dates, but also um, I do wild foraging in Dubai airport. So, you know, they have these really <laughs> fancy dates. <laughs> oh my gosh. And I asked them if I can, you know the spittoons yeah. where they put the yeah. pits? So I asked them if I can have those yeah. and they, they told me once, no, that's not allowed. That's yeah. not hygienic. Yeah. And I said, please talk to the manager. Yeah. And th those dates are expensive. Yeah. So I yeah. grabbed those pits, came home, we plant them and <laughs> just, why not try? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> right, we'll follow you out to the back veranda. Okay, great. Oh, actually, what's this you've got going on here? Oh, we're right. doing a lot of seed collection all the time. These are pomegranate from Yemen. This is Molokia, which is jute or oh, juice mallow. Wow. Yeah. Um, these are some bitter gourd. That, I mean, a, a bottle gourd that an Indian UN military person gave me in a refugee camp mm. in South Sudan. And the same with these uh, sponge gourds. We've got... I don't know the names in English. This is Mrenda and Derema. Um, this is parsley. <laughs> and so, yeah, uh, this is carob? from... Carob? Is it? Uh, yeah, that is carob um, from Cyprus. Mm -hmm. And then this is from Vandana Shiva's farm. That's cotton. And this tank, though, is um, for spirulina production that I want to try. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. And I think I might be able to use compost tea that I make from the worm castings as the mineral source oh, for wow. the spirulina. That's very exciting. Yeah. Oh, I look forward to seeing that one. So just off of my bedroom, I have this compost bin. <laughs> so I, you know, I really love kind of surprising people with the proximity, the spatial relationships, mm -hmm. because people, you would think that compost smells bad because yeah. it's a bunch of and rotting stuff. to stick it down the back corner. And actually, because yeah. it's down the back corner, it becomes a stinking mess. Right. If it's close, you look after it, don't you? Yeah. So, and, and the secret is carbon, because carbon is the diaper that soaks up the poop, which yep. is the nitrogen. Yep. And you want more diaper than poop, yes. right? <laughs> Um, <laughs> hopefully. And so here, this is what I kind of call the rough compost. So we've had baby chicks that died. They go in here. Mm -hmm. This is really what I don't... We have earthworms in here. Yeah. Um, but this is sort of the long, uh, the long rough compost we yep. put the undesirables in. And it, it breaks down and does great. Mm -hmm. So here is the back balcony. And we've got a lot of different things going on here. Again, if you don't have space, make space. So we've kind of made this wall and trellised it. And um, we've got, you know, things like cassava here. We've got, this is galangal, which is a volunteer that, I mean, I, I've grown it in the past, but it just decided to show up again. I just love that you have volunteers in your yeah. pots on your veranda. I mean, yeah. I talk about volunteers in my permaculture garden, yeah. Crystal Waters, but actually having volunteers. Oh, I've just got some self self-propagating galango that's this raspberry yeah. is a volunteer i don't have any idea where this came from yeah. or how it got here or some kind of berry um we've got chili peppers there's pumpkins this is chai oat squash here and of course we've got a little bee waterer it's a great thing to do with wine corks they're little bee rafts and then down here we're trying to do a little mushroom garden so we've put um we've put some of the grains of the oyster mushrooms and they're yeah. just myceliating um, this is pumpkin. This is a type of another type of Malabar spinach. Here we've got yam bean. Yep. From zaytuna. Mm-hmm. And uh, this I think is looks like watermelon. It's some, is it or some? No, I think it's a, a sponge gourd. Oh, okay, right. And then this is a star bean. Yeah, well, this, this one's a, one I've not seen before. Yeah, it's really interesting. So if you see this little tiny star. Yep. That's going to pop up to be a big fat bean that you can slice mm. or you dry the seeds and eat them like sunflower seeds. Uh, really popular right now in Thailand, Myanmar, Cambodia. So here's more Malabar spinach, the local variety, and that's just growing and cut, making a nice little canopy here. We've got strawberries and... And there's garlic chives over in the corner, yep, I can see. garlic chives. This is a Somali bean. So the reason I'm, pro I'm growing this is to get more seeds because mm. this is a perennial bean. Um, which is great for the refugee camps. So how long will this last, do you think? I don't know. It's, a, it's yeah, the first time I've, yeah, okay. I've planted it. So we can, you can see we've already got a few little beans coming oh, yeah. in. Yep. Um, and then more sweet potatoes, different varieties of sweet potatoes. 
And then um, this here is a black soldier fly larva farm. And not enough people know about black soldier fly larvae. They're an amazing little larva that is very, very full of omegas and high quality fats and protein. 5% um, calcium by volume, so great for egg production. Uh, but they eat the stuff that worms don't like. The stinky, the meats, the really fermenty stuff. Mm -hmm. um, not the citrus, but it, if an animal dies in nature, this is the thing that you know mm -hmm. will land, lay its eggs, and they eat that down. Mm -hmm. So they eat human feces. And increasingly around the world are being used in septic systems. Systems, because you can put them in there to eat up all the human waste, yep. pump them out, and then they can go into another uh, livestock system. So what fodder. about the, the kind of the pit toilets that are here? Yeah. Can you use that in, yeah. in those? Yeah. I mean, I, there's, I know there's one company called Sanergy um, that is experimenting with putting them in septic systems. Yep. And then pump them out and then send them to the pig farms yeah, or the right. poultry farms. Yep. Um, and the great thing is is that they self-harvest. So mm -hmm. they, they'll crawl out. And if you can devise a little system mm. that they crawl out over a fish pond mm. or in your chicken area, the chickens just Fantastic. eat them as they come up. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And it's a, they're a composter yep. also. Right, yeah. so it's another stream of so reducing. I've noticed you've got coffee grounds and things also on your and charcoal, yeah, and sawdust. These are another weeds, papaya trees. Yeah. <laughs> these are volunteers, so I'll dig these up and take them to the office. But yeah, we've got um, in in most of these bins, you'll find earthworms. Mm. If we dig it up, everyone has earthworms, just from the compost and all the cycling. Yeah, um, they're all in the system. So. You know, and I've got, we haven't seen it yet, but there's another small balcony, which is probably similar to what a lot of people have who live in apartments. Mm -hmm. But even in that little space, we've got containers and mm. growing at least some spinach and leaves. You know, if you can fit a pot on a windowsill, yeah. you can grow a basil plant. Yeah, that's least, right. You know. And you can have, you know, culinary herbs, yeah. medicinal herbs, yeah. edible flowers. We've got this chai out. <laughs> the, and do you eat the leaves of these too? Um, you can. Um, I give them sometimes to the chickens. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if nothing else, the leaves are biomass. Yeah, that's right. And so... And shade too. Yeah, shade and biomass and carbon that just mm. go back into the system to keep building soil. And so you also have one of my favourites here, the pumpkin growing. So, you know, the eating the pumpkin leaves yeah. is part of your... What's this one here? That, I'm not sure what that is. I mm. think that's just a yeah. weed that's come up. Is, is it an edible? It feels soft. Mm. Oh. It smells like um, the wild sesame. Oh, okay. Interesting. So, Perilla. yeah. Perilla. Oh. Is it could be. I think it is. Because it's purple perilla, green perilla. Just has that nutty smell about it. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know if it's the pro that I know. Self seeds really readily. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so Oh, and behind us here. Oh right. <laughs> so um I waited long for a ladybug, ladybird to show up in my garden. And when I finally saw her, I wanted to make her a palace. So this is Buggingham Palace. <laughs> Um, Bugging, yeah, that's free wife life. Yeah, <laughs> bad jokes. So, but basically, what I realize is that there are mm -hmm. insects coming into the system, and I want to make a habitat for them so they can lounge in the hotel and they've got an all you can eat buffet. Yeah, and um, you know, it's experimental, but what we see is that there's tons of little people, yeah, taking up you know, occupation in here. I don't even know who these are. Um, like these guys, I guess these are wasps, sorts, aren't they? Yeah, I think they're so making little sort of paper yeah. covers. Others are s shoving in, and we've got material. mud ones, yeah. and there's spiders, and like I don't know how these got plugged up, but yeah. So, you know, and I've seen more lizards here and birds. You know, so because if you look at biodiversity on a balcony, it's, it's yeah. durable. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. a little ecosystem, which yeah. is interesting because if you can see, you know, what the other apartments look like, we've got one of these too part of the ecosystem um it's you know it's a kind of a little concrete jungle and yeah. so a bird flying over will see this and they do they pick away at the strings for their nests <laughs> and that's okay yeah. right that's fair share yeah. so they take these little fibers to go build their nests but they bring happiness and color and their little turquoise birds and yeah. red birds um uh, but yeah, I mean, we do have monkeys sometimes as well. Yeah. I had a problem a few years ago, yeah. really bad. I would come out in the morning with my coffee and find my kale all over the roof. And 
So one of the questions I want to ask you was about how you keep the water up to these plants and so what's your watering strategy for these and also how do you keep how often do you keep adding material keep adding material or do you actually tip them out and both, restructure them both you know it is harder to manage soil in a pot yeah that's and it can right. get compacted yeah. and so we do a bit of everything um i do like to put handfuls of earthworms because they're really drilling yeah, and that's right. churning keep that up yeah. yeah um and keep it soft and stuff so it's ad hoc i mean it's also about my schedule because yeah. i travel like crazy and i my housekeeper is the farm manager we yeah. call this the fifth floor farm <laughs> uh she's the farm manager that's Susie. um so yeah. we'll add mulch when we have it when we've got you know We've got plenty of stuff right now, material yeah. that we're just trying to get into mm. the system and broken down. Um, but water, we we water from the tap, but also, um, I mean, I do always try to, if, you know, if it's raining, put the buckets out and catch yeah. some of that rainwater. Yeah. But the other thing that I like to do is catch or uh, capture water from the sink. So yeah. if I'm straining pasta, I like to do that into a bucket. Yeah. If I'm washing something and it's not too soapy, I'll toss that into the yeah. bucket. And then, you know, by the end of the day, you've got a whole full bucket. Yeah. And if you've got all this carbonaceous material and, you know, organic matter in your soil, it doesn't take a lot because it will really, yeah, that's right. um, you know, soak it up. And so do you also take, make your own liquid fertilizers from the oh, yeah. worms and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, so what we do is I make a compost tea. Um, I take castings from the earthworms, mm -hmm. put that into a bucket, yep. and add a, air, a, a bubbler, yep. a nozzle. Um, so we aerate that. And then I've been adding molasses, but I think that what the latest research is actually um, encouraging more of like uh, ancient grain flowers yeah. and maybe a shot of milk for protein yeah. Yeah. Um, and not a big shot of sugar because yeah. then there's too much yeah. rapid multiplication of the bacteria. So that's Dr. Lane Ingham's yeah. work. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So, but yeah, um, but we also, we've made comfrey tea. Yeah. I was growing comfrey, but then I realized that comfrey in a pot doesn't make much sense because the good thing it's about a, comfrey it's a deep nutrient right? miner I know so, like, it's a you know by, it would uh, still be doing dynamic dynamic accumulator like, from where <laughs> if you've got good soil I suppose it's sucking yeah. that in and then you can and the chickens love to eat yeah, it yeah, um, but right. I've you know taken that yeah. and other weeds and we'll just ferment them down yeah. leave it until it gets super stinky yeah. and yeah. then yeah so yeah a lot of different things yeah. oh and then we I make a banana tea so I have a beautiful vase that I bought from um, here in Kenya and um, I don't like to use uh, buy flowers because because the flower industry here uses a lot of chemicals. Yeah. So, but I want to enjoy my vase, mm. right? So sometimes if I buy bananas, I'll put the vase on the kitchen sink and then the banana peels just mm. go into, I fill it with water yep. and I just leave it and I give it a few stirs every day. And by the end of the week, when I finish my bananas, I've got this potassium rich, you know, liquid uh, fertilizer. And then ah. I just put that onto the- Thank you. Yeah, and the bananas break down yeah. and I just keep stirring so, it. So just a week? Yeah, I mean, or longer. I don't know. I eyeball it. The nose, yeah. nose. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> oh well, I'm gonna try that. Yeah. yeah. I've never thought about doing that. Yeah. The banana tea. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And I get to enjoy the vase. So. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> oh wow, that's awesome. <laughs> so do you want to? Are you happy to show us the last little sure. balcony? Yeah. Let's go there. Oh, I just want to show you this egg, egg production we've got. So we've had. Six or more eggs today. Yeah, and they're still gonna. Be yeah, full. we get plenty of eggs, and they're and they're beautiful little eggs because they're bantam chickens, aren't they? Yeah. Oh, before you go outside, you um, you were saying something about these. Yeah. Do you want to tell us quickly the recipe for these? So, um, I mean, it's really simple. You can just use any seeds. I didn't make these. I bought these, but I have made them, and they're always very popular. They don't last long. You can take seeds like sesame, flax, sunflower, pumpkin seeds, and then you just do, for example, 500 grams. So you do five mm -hmm. seeds, 100 grams each, and then you mix like two or three tablespoons of um, the psyllium husk powder and yeah. add hot water, and it gets all mucilaginous mm -hmm. and slimy, and then you just spread it thinly onto your baking surface yeah. and then lightly bake it, and it just creates a really crispy... They're so light and fluffy. Yeah. They're amazing. Yeah. I'm gonna try them. Yeah, it's so yeah. easy. I think we should, I'll have to put the recipe, send me the recipe and then I can yeah. spread that one out too. So here's our tiny balcony and we've got three pots out here and I could fit more on here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been thinking of, you know, how can we do a whole trellis here mm. and it closes, but we've just got, you know, some spinach and yeah, nice. chard and sweet potatoes. This volunteer is, tum um, is turmeric. 
that has come up. And I like having turmeric because I like when the leaves are big, I can use them for steaming. Yeah, yeah. Or if I'm serving like a Southeast mm. Asian meal, yeah. I like to put that as the plate, yeah. you know, as a de it's decorative. And then at the end of the day, actually, let me show you one last thing. Yes, um, sure. So <laughs> I had last time I harvested uh, the turmeric, what I did was I dried it and... Uh, you know, just dried it out in the sun and then grounded it up and made balcony turmeric powder. Oh my gosh, you and, are in turmeric powder. Yeah, and I love this because, you know, the idea of doing value addition in a small space. So again, mm -hmm. if you're a, a refugee woman mm -hmm. and can, you know, have a few pots of turmeric and, I mean, not that you're going to make my, huge okay. amounts of money um, and, it, and the scale, but even just oh, for my home use... Oh, it smells amazing. Yeah. But it just, I love that it comes kind of full circle like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I think no I worries. dropped a tiny bit. That's yeah, that's, that's messy that's stuff. <laughs> no worries. I'll, I'll just wipe it up. So, and then we've got like this tea. So I showed you that, that star bean. Um, the I'm star bean. the turmeric. No worries. I showed you the star bean that's growing out there. So these are the leaves that we dry for tea. Oh, so what do you call it? Star, uh, Sacha Inchi. Sacha Inchi. So, oh, yeah, I've heard of that. Yes. Yeah. The star bean. Yeah. Fantastic. So, yeah. Okay. And then we've got, you know, for my travels, like these are raisins from Yemen. Um, that's from Myanmar. We've got flaxseed from Ethiopia, basil seed from Cambodia. Um, palm sugar yeah. from Cambodia. So what do you do with basil seed? Because the, what what I found is that most people in Australia, in many parts of the world, actually just let their basil go to seed and yeah. it just falls over and they don't even think about collecting it or eating it. So in Southeast Asia, you know what bubble tea is? Yes. You know that yeah. like slimy little newt eyes? Yeah. Um, so what they do is, um, this is called krupchi in Khmer, mm -hmm. and they take this and soak it in coconut milk. Yep. Yeah and add palm sugar and this um what's it called pandan leaf yep which is like a has kind of a vanilla essence yep. and then you just chill that and it becomes a a liquidy eye of newt dessert wow and coconut yeah so it's wow. for that texture that kind yeah. of slimy little but just, i've also heard they like, you know grind it up as part of a like a flavor I'm sure, as well i'm and sure i mean yeah so many uses for it yeah but they they definitely use it a lot as yeah. a dessert, and I think it has a digestive. Yeah, well, um, I guess it has that mucilaginous yeah type thing that helps to. And then here I'm doing a lot of. Um, I got I came back with like ten kilos of honey from Ethiopia, so I'm doing oh honey garlic gosh. fermented. Oh, it's really wow. Can smells. I smell that? I have to fart it. Yeah. <laughs> And then, you know, my family's from oh, Poland, wow. and when we got, had a cough as children, the women would mm. slice up onions, put sugar on it, and it would sweat this syrup, and they gave us that syrup. So I just decided to do that with honey, and that one smells not great. Oh, wow, that's intense. Yeah. Yeah. So, you Gosh, know, there's you're never intense projects. Wonderful things, and, <laughs> and you've been feeding us kefir and amazing oh, things from all over. Yeah, and work takes you to such interesting. What do you say? Sixty countries you've been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's extraordinary. Yeah, no, it's been uh, it's good. I, I enjoy traveling and learning and seeing mm -hmm. yeah. how many versions there are of how mm -hmm. to do human. Yeah, <laughs> and also I think what's fascinating too is that to start to see plants and food differently and all the different parts that we we often just walk past or completely overlook because we've forgotten. Yeah, I've forgotten what's food. You know, it's not just the rice and the wheat and the, yeah. you know, the standards, spuds and all that. We it's suffer from plant blindness. We do. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, the this opportunity... This you've got is not that fresh. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, I mean, the, the opportunity to, to be able to go and, and learn from yeah. cultures that have so much rich and in-depth knowledge still about mm -hmm. all those plants and they, they haven't yeah. forgotten yet. They're Some, intact with the landscape yeah, still. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, you know, many cultures have forgotten or it's, you know, you've got to go to the elders, but still, yeah. it's, you know, what you've been able to witness and, and, to, and to bring back alive and to share with other people, it's an amazing thing.
Yeah, yeah. I enjoy it. And, you know, it, it's, I'm always, like, the connections keep kind of emerging, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, so, no, I enjoy it. And um, So you're working mostly with women in refugee environments? Anyone, anyone. Anyone, anyone yeah. affected by displacement. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, we're just looking at design solutions yeah. at the shelter or the camp or the community level on yeah. water security. Yeah. On And it can go up to even, you know, yeah. um, land restoration around camps yeah. and, um, you know, uh, how we do water, how we save, save seeds, how we grow food in small spaces. And, you know, we, we're getting a lot of gardens right now. Yeah. Um, so the value of permaculture for this type of context, yeah. what, what's your take on that? I mean... Permaculture is just an obvious design solution to any problems that we have as humans in any context or scale, right? Mm -hmm. It's about how do we how do we solve for the problems in ways that nature might do that, mm -hmm. um, starting with green chemistry, by the way, right? Mm -hmm. And shifting to bioplastics mm -hmm. and yeah. looking at all the opportunities within and around, and, you know, it's not only refugee camps, you mm -hmm. have refugees in urban areas. Yeah, that's right. And so, you know, there's so many opportunities. Mm -hmm. And when we look at, you know, the more kind of points of juncture that we have in a system, the more resilient the whole system is. And so when we look at symbiotic relationships between waste and any materials and fibers, you know, do a fiber shed mapping. Yeah. Um, the coconut fire, hemp, the silks, the cottons, the waste products, the materials, the bones, the blood, everything. And how can we give that another spin on the merry-go-round? And how do we create enterprise out of that so that people are resilient socially, financially, ecologically, in many ways. So what you're asking is for people to shift their perception about what it is that they see around them. Mm -hmm. Just just to see, mm -hmm. not to bring in anything new necessarily, but to see differently what they have available. Yeah. So what's your first starting point in, in doing that? I mean, you go uh, in the Somali refugee camps, for example. Mm -hmm. People are doing ablution, which means they're washing their feet up to five times a day yeah. and that can be a liter per person yeah. and if you're in a family of five that is a lot yeah. of liters of yeah. water and so that literally gets dropped onto the ground where yeah. it either evaporates or it puddles and pools and creates a disease Disneyland yeah. you know yeah. and so immediately we can just put that water into production yeah. and dig a hole even if all you're doing is taking leaf matter and you know uh, plant residue and some mm -hmm. food scraps um, and putting that in the soil with water, you're already activating yeah, the, right. the life that's in the soil. Yeah. Um, but then you throw a seed in there, yeah. you plant some bananas around it, and you start slowly you start to create this tiny little yeah. micro jungle around a refugee camp, which yeah. by the way can bring down heat island effect. Yeah, yeah. When we focus on urban ecology at the camp context, then we bring down temperatures. Mm -hmm. And also addressing disease because yeah. you're, you're addressing that health issue of the, the yeah. cooling water. Yeah, so places. pathogens and yeah. just health, the stress from being in a hot environment. You know? So it, it means going into a place with really open eyes and finding the points of connection, the very small, simple yeah. starting points, and then weaving it from that rather than sort of, I've got big ideas and I've got no, a no, solution no. for you, it's coming in. Go and see what's there yeah. and at that level. So I'll give you an example. I was on the Burundi-Tanzania border and this old man had his shelter in a camp and he had strung up a bunch of strings. He made a big pit and he um, and he had strings trellised out of it uh, on the structure he made and he was trying to grow passion fruit. Mm. There were a lot of trees around there and there were leaves everywhere, dried mm. leaves everywhere and mm. then just across from it was a tippy tap. Do you know what a tippy yeah, tap yeah. is? Yeah, a little yeah. water point that you just tip, you know. And so I just said, please take all of these leaves, put them mm. into that pit and move the tippy tap next to that mm. and then make it with a spoon or a stick a little channel so yeah. that water can go in there. And when I said that, he immediately knew what I meant. Yeah. And the so connection. I've done nothing. I've, there's no money that's been spent. Yeah. It, it, you know, the input... It, no it, new technologies. Um, yeah, it's just that knowledge is the input. We yeah. don't have to have expensive <clears throat> inputs. It's yeah. knowledge is the input. Mm. And so the minute I said that, I mean, it just, he completely yeah. got it. Yeah. And so he started immediately sweeping the leaves in there. Mm -hmm. and Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And so kitchen water, uh, cooking water, bathing yeah. water, all those are resources. Yeah. yeah. And so it's trying to find so many extra uses along the way for absolutely everything that's in the system. Mm -hmm. So that it, you know, from the source to the sink, everything, yeah. everything has as many uses as possible. And yeah. Yeah. What, like you're saying, what goes out, basically yeah. what comes out of the toilet, but what goes into the toilet then has another use anyway, so it's the yeah. whole cyclical system really, isn't it? Yeah, and so back to the original point that I started with is, you know, here in my system, there's, you know, I'll turn a piece of cardboard into compost, into food, 
and then that leaves through my toilet and not just putting the garbage, you know, the, the cardboard box yeah. in the garbage and, bin. Or into the recycling bin in Australia. Yeah. You go, oh, I've done a good thing. I've put cardboard yeah. into the recycling bin. That's right fake bin. news, by the way. That's yes. fake news. <laughs> it is, isn't it? You know, like, we, we're, you know, we're very good at, at separating our waste now, but still creating an abundance of it and still sending it off. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's yeah. madness. To that place yeah. called away. So, okay. Thanks so much, Stan Lee. It's just been an absolute pleasure to stay with you here and to talk all about the things that you've been doing and to, to see how you can do permaculture on a balcony and not just a few pots of, of greens, yeah. but actually all the system, that whole, the, the cycles and the, and the life that you've, you've brought into this place and the ecology. It's been amazing. And yeah. Thank you for sharing it. Of course, it's a good journey. Not all perfect, a lot of lessons, but keep trying. But isn't that what it's all yeah, about? For sure. It's yeah. been a lot of fun learning. Yeah, great. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks.